Hey, how's it going everybody? This is Craig Peters here from Sound Iron, and in today's Sound Iron session, we're gonna be looking at the music that I wrote for the Hyperion Brass Elements trailer. And Hyperion Brass Elements is the newest addition to our orchestral line of products. So let's go ahead and take a look at the track and then we'll break down some of the composing, mixing, and much more. So before I started doing any sort of composing for this trailer, one of the things that I did was I built a Sound Iron Orchestral template using Vienna Ensemble Pro 6. Uh, basically just having our strings, brass, I'm also using some Symphony Series woodwinds. Uh, not in this track, but I do have that in the template. As well as some of our choirs, and for this track I'm using our Requiem Light Choir. Mainly the Ensemble Marcato patch, which allows me to kind of go between different phrases really easily, and I'll, we'll show that in a little bit. So for the start of this track, I wanted it to really build over time, and it's not that long of a trailer, but I wanted it to sort of utilize uh, the string sections as kind of like this like countdown sort of metronome kind of feel. So let's just go ahead into the strings, and then let's listen to just how this sounds by itself. Got some violas coming in, just kind of building over time every couple bars. And then we got the cellos and the basses doing coinos. And then around bar five, I also started bringing in some other percussion from Ape to kind of aid in to a little bit of that uh, that that countdown sort of sound. So let's go ahead and check how this sounds. kind of adding in some actual percussion with string instruments doing more percussive like articulations. And then once I kind of had that percussive rhythm already built with the strings and the percussion, I knew I wanted to start also bringing in some brass at the beginning and not really a lot of brass, just kind of accents and swells just to really kind of aid in that sort of, uh, that kind of build up and, and that swelling feel like something's, something big is gonna be coming a little bit more down the line. So let's go ahead and listen to just the brass by itself. So you can see I pretty much have this D-sharp playing the whole time. But then I have these other notes up top that are just kind of creating some little clusters and semitones so you can hear how this sounds. So we got the A-sharp. And then we go up to B. So you can hear sort of it's leading somewhere and that's the whole point is I want this to kind of like lead up into where that big boom, that big bombastic note kind of blows in. So we have that. And then basically when everything kind of comes to a peak and everything sort of comes together, I have this riser from Glitch Hero and let's just hear how this sounds by itself. It comes in around bar nine. And this is just kind of bringing in some of that hybrid elements just to sort of, you know, not really trailer it up, but just give it a little bit of that sort of uh, hybrid kind of sound. And then basically at measure 10, everything kind of comes in full guns blazing. So let's go ahead and hear how this sounds. Uh, we'll start it from where the riser is. So 
So one of my favorite things when I listen to orchestral music is when you hear a melody kind of being passed back and forth between the orchestra. And with this being more brass dominant, I wanted to keep it more within the brass sections. So you pretty much hear this kind of melody being thrown around that bum ba da da bum 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 ba da da, and then you hear little trumpets kind of playing off, like call and response, kind of throwing the melody around. So let's go ahead and listen to that one more time. So and then it all kind of comes together. So I basically wanted it to have this sort of you know, passing back and forth melody and then eventually it all kind of is coming together in, as one kind of cohesive orchestral unit. And that's a fun thing that you can do when you, let's say, have a melody or a piano sketch. You know, you can have the more percussive rhythmic stuff be a certain part of the orchestra, maybe it's strings, and then the main sort of singer, or the, the more foreground orchestral section could be taking the melody and kind of throwing it around. So that's a, a really good way of kind of keeping things interesting without just having the entire orchestra like strings and brass and everyone playing the melody really try to think of it as you know foreground middle ground background like who's who's going to be doing the more percussive rhythmic stuff maybe it's just drums and then there's certain parts of the orchestra just kind of supporting the rhythm while there might be something else you know kind of driving the rhythm a little bit more maybe it's strings and then you can have some other section of the orchestra sort of really carrying the melody and and just you know, and that's the thing about orchestral music, and it could really kind of go all over the place. There's so many different choices. So it's a lot of fun to have, and you can really keep things interesting just by passing stuff around. So for the strings on this section, I don't really have them doing that much more, just kind of supporting notes. And those tremolos really kind of help to just sort of aid to that swell up. So one way to get a realistic orchestral performance using virtual instruments is to utilize all of the different articulations from staccatissimos, staccatos, long notes, different types of swells, Hyperion brass elements, along with Hyperion strings elements, come with a lot of different expressions. And you can use these to really craft some really uh, expressive and realistic performances. So for example, like the trumpets, I have some staccatissimos, some double tongue, some crescendos high, and some decrescendos low. So let's go ahead and listen to see how this sounds. So for like a bar 14, where it does this kind of decrescendo, comes down, and then the crescendo swells up, so I'm using two different expressions to kind of create my own sort of movement within this melody. So by doing it this way, I'm just kind of customizing my own sort of expressions by utilizing multiple at the same time. And then the same thing goes for horns, so let's go ahead and open that up and we can hear how this sounds. So by doing it this way, using those staccatissimos for those really short notes, that's that sforzando right there. And then towards the end, I'm also crafting that sort of decrescendo, crescendo swell, and also incorporating this little tension note right here, just to kind of add that little bit of anticipation before it falls back down. And then that little short note at the end, just to kind of close it out, put a little cap on it. And then we also have the tenor trombones doing their own thing too. Let's listen to how that sounds. And that little part, it's only that section that's playing that little bum 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 bum. Because I wanted to have one of the sections kind of do this little sort of scale down to kind of close it out. And the trombones really have this big kind of mighty full bite to them. So let's go ahead and listen to this one more time.
And then we also have some bass trombones. Let's go ahead and listen to what they sound like. So I pretty much just have the bass trombones doing sforzandos, and then I also have the staccatos at the same time, just kind of adding a little bit of punch to the very beginnings of the notes. So if we go ahead right here and listen to just the staccatos. So it's just pretty much acting as uh, adding another layer of just kind of punch to that note. And then if we go ahead and play the sforzando on top of that. So if we go ahead and take out those staccatos and see how it sounds. So, I mean, those sforzandos really have a nice pop to them, but I just pretty much use the staccatos just to add a, an extra layer of definition to those beginning notes. And then at the very end, we have that decrescendo and crescendo. And then we also can't forget tubas. And tubas, to me, the way I think about it is kind of like the basis of of the brass section. Basically, I, I usually use them as more of a supporting role or just kind of backing up some of the other uh, bass trombones or trombones just as more of a supporting type of role, mainly just kind of filling in that low end of the orchestral mix. So let's go ahead and take a listen to just the tubas by themselves. So pretty much just kind of doing what the bass trombones are doing, just a little bit lower. I think it's about an octave lower, just to kind of really kind of add in that kind of burly low end. And then to really take this track and give it that big epic feel, I wanted to bring in some choir. So I'm using our Requiem Light Choir. And for this, I'm using the Ensemble Marcato patch set to phrase. And this allows you to change between the different phrases just by playing and releasing the notes. So let's go ahead and listen to how this sounds. <laughs> And these are basically just backing up the chords, but by having that phrase set, it allows it to kind of change so it sounds like this choir section is singing these different phrases. And then a track like this wouldn't be what it is with a little bit of percussion too. So I'm using our Apocalypse Percussion Ensemble. And this is pretty much just kind of accenting or building up into certain parts to really kind of make it really big and bombastic. So let's listen to the percussion just by itself. So out of context, it might sound a little odd or funny, but when you listen to it with everything together, you can see why some of those hits are where they are. So let's go ahead and listen to it all together again. And then you can hear towards the end as it's kind of hanging on that, uh, that little half step note on the horns, I got this roll kind of just sort of hanging on just to sort of build that tension before it finally comes to a close. Let's hear how that sounds. So for the mastering, I basically have a preset that I use of different plugins and then I'll just sort of massage them, tweak them a little bit depending on the track. And this is using Goldfoss, pretty much just using this to kind of filter out a lot of the different frequencies. Sometimes when you have a lot of stuff going on, this kind of helps sort of clean everything up in a really easy way, an intelligent way, and I just kind of let it do its thing. And then I'm also using some slate plugins. I got some trimmer on here, basically just to kind of kick a little bit more headroom in. And then this virtual mix bus, just to kind of add a little bit more of that kind of analog sound. I'm using the Brit 4K and just kind of feeding everything into that. 
And then for my mix bus compression, I'm using the SSL G comp, and this is my favorite one to use. It just sounds great. And I really like how it sounds. And then for my settings, I'm basically using the attack at 30. I have the release set to auto, and then I have the ratio as a two to one. And then I basically just adjust that threshold into where it's sitting a little bit between zero and four. Usually like that middle ground where it's not pumping and it's not really smashing it, but it's just kind of like that nice middle ground. And then I'm also using the Slate Virtual Tape Machine, and this is just another layer of bringing in some of that analog warmth and analog grit, just kind of, you know, trying to warm up the sound a little bit, smooth out some of the transients and that sort of thing. And then I have some FabFilter Pro Q3, and this is basically just doing a little bit of high passing, a little bit of bump in the low end, just to kind of give it a little bit more, a little more oomph. And then I got this high shelf, basically just kind of bringing out a little bit more highs just to make it sparkle a little bit. And then I'm just using these bands in the middle just to kind of scoop it out a little bit to sort of clear out any kind of muddy frequencies. And I like to just, really be subtle with this EQ on the master bus. I, I like to try to handle most of my mixing within the tracks or groups. So for this is more of just kind of like a final stage of just a little bit of EQ just to kind of shape it in the final in the final stages. And then for my limiting, I'm also using a few different things. I'm using Flatline from Submission Audio, and then I'm also using Ozone 9 from Isotope. And I'm basically just using these in combination. I don't like to really smash the limiter in the very end but I like to use maybe a couple different ones because Flatline has a little bit more of that sort of uh, analog mastering sound. And then Ozone is just really good for just kind of doing a few other things. Cause not only am I doing limiting, I also have some imaging and I also have this exciter just to kind of, you know, bring a little bit of harmonic frequencies to the mix. So, um, you know, a little bit of a, of a chain, but I mean, all of this in context, like if you listen to this with nothing, So you can see in the end, you know, it's all these little moves that are basically giving you the full sound. And uh, yeah, and that's basically it for the mastering. And then in a recent podcast, me and Nathan were talking about some of our favorite new plugins. And this one that I've been using on percussion is really cool. And it's called the Chef's uh, Parallel Particles. And basically, I'm just kind of using this as a way of just kind of adding some, uh, some bite. It's got air, thickness, and sub. So if I go ahead and turn this off... Now let's play that again with it on. So you can hear really kind of makes it a little bit more over the top than it already is. So to wrap things up in this video, I want to talk about the reverb that I'm using, and I'm using the Cinematic Runes by Liquid Sonics. I did a full video showing how I use this reverb to really create an, uh, a realistic orchestral space. If you want to check that out, you can go up here. I'll have it linked above. And this is just a great reverb. There's a lot of controls for really shaping the sound and making the space. If you have dry instruments like Hyperion strings and brass, which are fairly dry, and I definitely purposely made them dry. Uh, I didn't use any reverb that's built in and because I really wanted to place it in its own orchestral space. So this is the reverb that I use for that. All right, so that about wraps up this episode of Sound Iron Sessions. If you'd like to learn more about Hyperion Brass Elements or any of the other instruments that I use in this video, make sure to go to soundiron.com. I want to thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video, make sure to give it a like and subscribe if you haven't for future videos. And until next time, I want to say thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Take care.